Please turn now in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21. Luke 21. Last time we continued our study of this chapter where Jesus began to answer the disciples' questions about the timing of what he had just promised was coming. That thing that he just promised was coming was the complete destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. They asked when and what sign to expect to know that that was about to happen. And as I told you last week, Matthew's account in Matthew chapter 24 added some important information for us on that topic. Because Matthew included there that, in fact, Jesus included, the the disciples had asked Jesus about the sign of his coming in that same conversation about your coming and about the end of the age. And so you may remember that as we went through Jesus' answer last week, or the first portion of it, we saw how many parallels that there are between the signs that lead up to both the destruction of the temple in time past, as well as Christ's promised return in time to come at the end of this age that we are living in now. So to briefly review, Jesus first warned that many would come in his name. They were asked for signs of that, and that was the first sign that he talked about. Deception related to who Jesus is and whether, in fact, particularly, he has come back or not. He said, some will come in my name or some will come to be actually be Messiah, they will claim, or to be for him or from him. Jesus said, do not be deceived about that. Do not go after them. Also, he warned that wars and commotions or rumors of wars, that that would also rise. And related to that, he said, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of those things. He said, those things have to come to pass. But even after that, he says, the end is not yet. Jesus went on to further describe potentially fearful developments. Not that the developments are potential. The developments are sure, but they're potentially fearful. And so that's what his encouragement is to us, is to not be afraid. And so he described other things related to that. Wars, earthquakes, famines, pestilences, and quite wild cosmic disturbances. He described and doing so once again, calling his disciples to not be afraid when those things come, not if, but when. Then he also gave another thing to look out for, and that was and is persecution, coming even before all of those things. Persecution for Jesus' followers that he began to describe. It's going to include arrests and interrogations. You're going to be brought forward for questioning and so on. And he says that his disciples are to not, in those instances, worry about what to say in their defense of their Christian faith, because he promised to provide them wise, timely words. We also saw that Jesus gave his disciples the spiritually mature and heavenly-minded way to view those challenges, particularly persecution. Jesus says that's a good thing. He didn't say it would be easy or fun, but he said it is good. And he said, why? Because it's going to be an opportunity for you to testify. It's going to be an occasion for testimony, and any Christian has to agree that is a good thing. An occasion for testimony is good. The pain of persecution, we might not jump for joy about it specifically, but the fruit of it, what it is coming for, and the fruit it is to bear, the occasion for testimony that it is, that makes it a good thing. Jesus even expanded on what persecution would look like. He he described family divisions, betrayal, hatred, and even death for Jesus' sake. And in all of that, the message is don't be afraid. Do not doubt God's love for you in those situations. Do not doubt God's care for you. When in those situations, doubting God's love or doubting God's care, doubting God's sovereign control can be tempting. And yet we are to not doubt those things in troubling times for he is with us in the midst of And he is using us for his glory as we faithfully testify of God's truth and of God's love. And our study last time closed at verse 19, where Jesus calls his followers to endure. Patience, perseverance, endurance. We know that Christ himself did that very thing in his own earthly life, leaving us an example to follow. 
Now, remember how we talked about the parallels of those signs, right? How those signs led up to both the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, as well as are leading up to the return of Christ Jesus to the earth and the end of the age and the full ushering in of the kingdom of Messiah on the earth. So those signs, remember, deception, wars, commotions, earthquakes, famines, pestilences, cosmic disturbances, and persecutions have all come in the past, are all now on the rise once again. Historically, we know that those things did lead up to the destruction of the temple and of the city of Jerusalem by the Romans. We know that those things are all leading up to Christ's return for us in our day. Jesus' purpose in saying so was the same for them as it is for us today. This is the the lessons to carry through the study of this chapter and this topic of end times. Don't be deceived. Don't be afraid. Don't be surprised even. Instead, be watchful and be ready, which we'll see Jesus continue to reinforce for us this morning in the rest of his answer. We also need to remember that Jesus was telling his disciples then that the destruction of the temple in particular would not be a sign of the end of the age. Now today in the rest of his answer, Jesus is going to give a little more separation, a little bit more separation between those two events of the temple's destruction and his second coming. We'll see a little bit more separation. And in fact, it's one of the things he says about the destruction of the temple in the city of Jerusalem itself that shows how there is a significant time that's going to pass between those two events. How significantly the destruction of the temple is definitely not right on the cusp of the end, but there is much time in between before Jesus returns. So let's pick up where we left off. We're going to start in chapter uh, 21, of course, of Luke's gospel, verse 20. Jesus brings more specific prophetic attention now to Jerusalem. So in verse 20, he says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. So Jesus has already given a prophetic outline of trends and signs that his disciples should watch out for, should expect, should prepare for. Those signs in part pointed to the coming destruction of the temple in the city, which Jesus is referring to specifically now. Some of what being ready was supposed to look like was to avoid being deceived, avoid being afraid, avoid being surprised, avoid being shocked. But then, when the event itself is upon them, now he's telling them here how to respond as well. He wants them, when it becomes clear that the city is about to be besieged, get out and stay out. And don't come back in here because, as he says there quite plainly, its desolation, its ruin is near. Others among the Jews, without a prophetic word like Jesus, if he's your Lord and you take him at his word, others, though, among the Jews, when they would have seen the city about to be besieged, they would never have abandoned the holy city. That's why the word of Jesus to his followers is so important for them so that they avoid the destruction. But Jews themselves would would scarcely even consider abandoning the holy city and would scarcely even consider that even within the holy city itself that the very temple, the house of God, could be destroyed. That is so far from anything that they would even consider as, as possible or even likely or even remotely possible. Surely... God would not let that happen here. Surely, God would not let his temple, of all things, be brought low. And so they would not have listened to this, but Jesus' followers did. And they did listen to this. Uh, The others, though, would have listened to others among them who thought for sure God would never let that happen, that the Roman assault would be put down. As we know, Though, Jerusalem and Israel at large, the religious leadership in particular, they've already rejected, they're about to crucify Jesus in our Gospel of Luke timeline here in just another day or two, but they've already rejected God's promised Savior, the chief cornerstone himself. We know that Jesus had already pronounced coming judgment on them because of that. And back in chapter 19, you remember he said, if you, Jerusalem, had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. 
but now they are hidden from your eyes, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. And so Jesus declared what was coming and he declared why. So here now, back in chapter 21, when armies surround the city, he's saying, Jesus warns his disciples to escape the destruction that's going to follow that kind of siege. So first question, obviously, this is easy. Did that apply to the actual destruction of the temple that occurred in 70 AD? Of course it did. It's very directly related to that. In fact, as we've mentioned before, it was because of these very words from Jesus that of all the people groups in Jerusalem, the Christians, by and large, did escape because they heeded Jesus' words. They fled the city. They survived, particularly in a place history tells us called Pella, while over one million Jews perished in the four-year siege beginning in 66, ending in 70, the four-year siege of the Romans there in the battle against those in Jerusalem, and so on. Second question, though, does this also apply to the return of Christ and the end of this age? Well, it does. It does, and here is how. When you consider this portion of Jesus' answer in the other gospel records, Matthew and Mark, Matthew 24 and Mark 13, there we see Jesus reference a specific event from Old Testament prophecy from the book of Daniel. Luke's record doesn't mention it, but Matthew's and Mark's do. It is called the abomination of desolation, and in any study of the Olivet Discourse, you have to give that serious consideration in any study whatsoever. So, in both Matthew and Mark, we see Jesus say, when you see, in this very context, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, meaning standing in the holy place, and it says, let the reader understand. Then he says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And even in there with Matthew and Mark, you have the parenthetical little phrase there, let the reader understand. Meant by the Spirit, giving Matthew and Mark what to write, that the reader is supposed to understand. Not just go past it and not go, abomination of desolation sounds bad, and then we just move on. It's specifically in there so that the reader understands. So we're going to take a little time this morning and make sure that we do. Jesus gives this specific term now, the name of this specific event, this specific occurrence, and he tells us where to find it. To his Jewish audience, it would not be unfamiliar at all, Today, though, it might be unfamiliar to almost any audience that you can come up with. And so, in the book of Daniel, he mentions. Now, remember that Daniel, Daniel was a prophet in, uh, when the Jews were in captivity, first under the Babylonians, then under the Persians. Daniel was a man who received tremendous visions and prophecies from the Lord. God showed him the various kingdoms of man over the centuries that would lead into the end times when he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. God showed Daniel visions of the end times itself. God showed Daniel the timing of when Messiah would present himself to the nation of Israel in Jerusalem, which we know Jesus perfectly fulfilled. And in fact, the whole second half of the book of Daniel, chapters 7 through 12, which we happen to start studying this Wednesday night, there are almost all visions and prophecies, fascinating things for us to read and study, and we're going to do a little bit of that in the next few minutes. It's in Daniel 11, though, where we first find the actual phrase, abomination of desolation. But before we go there, I'm going to send you to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 is very important setup. Go there if you would, please. We'll be in Daniel for a few minutes. Very important setup in Daniel 9 as a reference for the abomination of desolation. We'll see it referenced there. In Daniel 9, it's where we find the very well-known, very famous 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. And it's in Daniel 9.25 where he wrote about the specific timing for Messiah to enter Jerusalem and how they would respond to him. That's where Daniel wrote about 
the 69 weeks or the 69 seven-year periods, 483 years from point A, which is the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until point B, the coming of Messiah, the prince. 483 years from the command in history of the Persian king Artaxerxes to restore and build Jerusalem until the presentation of Messiah personally and officially to Jerusalem, to the Jews, which, of course, Christ Jesus did, Palm Sunday, triumphal entry, and we looked at that back in Luke 19 a few weeks ago. After that, in Daniel 9.26, it says that after that time, Messiah will be cut off. He's going to present himself, but he will be cut off, but not for himself. So we see that he'll be rejected, and in fact that he'll be killed, which Jesus was, of course, his crucifixion there, but not yet receiving his kingdom. Then it says, the people of the prince who is to come. That is the satanically empowered antichrist and those who do his will in defiance of God. Those people shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, it says. Now that can point to the spirit of Antichrist behind the pagan Romans destroying the city and temple in 70 AD. It more specifically and easily and prophetically fully points to a time to come ahead of us on our timeline. Then though it says the end of it shall be with a flood and till the end of the war desolations are determined. That would point to the flood out, the actual flood of people out, the dispersion and the scattering of the Jews all over the world, which did take place after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And of course, the ongoing conflict that still takes place in about regarding Jerusalem itself. And we know that there is constant conflict, constant disagreements, constant strong words, about who Jerusalem belongs to and what should be done with it and who should control what parts and who should give up control of what parts. And there is a constant political back and forth. We'll come to more of that shortly, both this morning and in days to come. So the Roman destruction of the temple in Jerusalem can be seen so far, just as the end times more fully can be seen in what Daniel's prophesying. Now, though, it gets more specific to where it can only refer to end times. Verse 27 of Daniel 9, it says, Then he, who is he? He is the prince who is to come, just mentioned in verse 26, who is Satan's antichrist, just as Satan himself is even referred to elsewhere as the prince or the ruler of this world. uh, He will be empowering antichrist, the scriptures tell us. It says he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Remember, that's a seven-year period. But in the middle of the week, halfway through the seven years, he, Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So this man makes a covenant, he makes a deal, a seven-year agreement of some kind, which he will personally violate halfway through when he commands an end to sacrifices and offerings, leads to judgment from God, desolation, and destruction. Prophecies like these show us that while there is obviously no temple standing in Jerusalem today, there must be one to come. There must be. And so there is. It's interesting then to see various news items that have come out over these last several years from Jerusalem, in particular from groups like the Temple Institute, who I've mentioned to you before, who continue to openly and very gladly make preparations for a third temple itself as far as the building is concerned and all of the operations, priestly and so on, that are going to go with it. They've been replicating all the Levitical instruments and items used in the ancient temple down to the smallest details that you can find in the Old Testament. They've been raising and preparing all of the proper sacrificial animals. A couple of years ago, they announced the inauguration of a new school for the training of priests who by their bloodline descendancy qualify to learn how to perform all the daily duties and offerings and such for operating the temple. And so developments continue to point toward a third temple, just as the scriptures make plain. 
And while a temple for the Jews on the currently Muslim-controlled Temple Mount sounds impossible today, we can safely include, or safely conclude, I should say, based on the authority of prophetic scripture, that there will indeed be a temple there, and people can uh, fuss and moan and and throw all kinds of fits and and make all kinds of lousy declarations and so on. There is going to be a temple on that hill, you can rest assured. We can safely conclude that, and that it's uh, also fairly safe, I think, to conclude that with this one to come, this Antichrist figure, that with the seven-year agreement brokered by him, we would expect that probably that temple and the peaceful, at least at the first, operating of it would be part of that uh, from the influential and persuasive Antichrist figure that we have. Now move over to Daniel 11. In the vision of that chapter, he is describing a king, a world leader, as a man of peace, who initially takes power over the kingdom of the earth by intrigue, not by force, but by intrigue. And then after a league, it says, or an agreement or a pact, after a league is made with him, he will go afterward and act deceitfully, it says, appearing to still be a man of peace, a man who wants peace, but instead uh, the scriptures tell us that he is a man who actually wants war and conquest. That's his real goal. And in Daniel eleven thirty one, it says, And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary fortress. Then they shall take away the daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. And down in verse 36, it says, Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god. He shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods and shall prosper till the wrath, until the wrath, has been accomplished. And so that even tells us that even him rising to power is a part of a bigger deal, part of a bigger plan, all a part of the wrath of God on the earth, and in particular, him dealing with his people Israel, although not to destroy, but to save. It says that for what has been determined shall be done, verse 37, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. We, not surprisingly, have New Testament references for this as well. The Apostle Paul talks about the times leading up to the second coming of Christ in 2 Thessalonians 2. He says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself or presenting himself that he is God. All right? Revelation chapter 13. Go there if you would, please. There the apostle John is describing the vision he received of the end of the age as well. And there he says he saw a beast who is the Antichrist, empowered by the dragon, who is the devil. And then he saw a second beast, who is the false prophet, who causes the people of the world to worship the Antichrist. And Jesus has warned already about false prophets to come, has he not? Revelation 13, John describes what he saw about the Antichrist, saying in verse 6, Then he, the Antichrist, opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So he blasphemes God. He blasphemes God's tabernacle, that third temple in Jerusalem yet to be built. The sacrifices and offerings will have resumed. The peace deal will be in place. But this beast, this Antichrist, eventually shows his true colors, his true plans, sets himself up as God himself, actually claiming to be God, demanding to be worshipped, and the false prophet will be at his side, compelling people of the world whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life to worship the beast, to worship the Antichrist. And then in verse 12, John says that false prophet exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. goes on to say that he performs great signs and wonders and that he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs. And so again, the danger of being deceived and the exhortation Jesus started with 
in his answer, to not be deceived, to stay true to who Jesus is. Who he is and when he comes back are plain. And you need to not be deceived. We need to not be tricked by that. Anybody who loves the Lord at that time needs to be careful about Jesus' words here. We see that the Antichrist, the king that Daniel described, uh, called the man of sin by Paul, we see that he makes war against the people of God. All right? Now, back in Daniel chapter 7, feel free to turn there or not. I'm going to read anyway. His vision in Daniel 7 includes beasts, just like John's does in Revelation. They both also reference horns on the beast, which represents kings or leaders of men. Daniel 7.21 and following, this is what uh, Daniel saw and then had explained to him. He says, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them. That matches what we just read from John's revelation. Until, however, the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Can I get an amen on that? I want, I want an amen. I'm looking forward to the kingdom, possessing it, seeing the enemy, the very, the very embodiment of the enemy of our God put down. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, uh, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. After that, his kingdom is going to be destroyed, it says there, from the second coming of Christ, coming to personally take care of that, whom Daniel there refers to as the Ancient of Days, until he comes. A time, times, and half a time means a year, an additional two years, and another half year on top of that. So you have a three and a half year period there. What would be left over after Antichrist violates his seven year peace deal halfway through? Three and a half years. Now, one more Daniel reference in Daniel chapter 12 with this three and a half year period in mind. Daniel 12, 11. Daniel is told, and from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. That's a good approximation for three and a half years. So, all of these things, especially since Jesus points us back to Daniel, it all shows us how the abomination of desolation, that specific occurrence committed by Antichrist in time to come, that is a precise sign of Jesus' second coming. There are signs that lead up to the destruction of the temple. There are signs that lead up to the abomination of desolation. And now that itself the abomination of desolation, is a sign. There are things that we should see uh, trending to expect that, but that itself is the most significant, unique, and powerful sign that Jesus' return is absolutely on the horizon. And it even points us to start that clock three and a half years once that takes place. All right, that was fun. Back in Luke 21... Let's see what Jesus said next. So, both in reference to the Romans' destruction of Jerusalem, on the one hand, as well as in reference to Antichrist's abomination of desolation, those in and around Jerusalem, on both of those occasions, should immediately flee and escape the city. And we've already read why. He actually continues to describe why here, verse 22. For these are the days of vengeance, so that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now in reference to both events, temple and Christ's return, all right? the destruction of the temple and Christ's return, Jesus says that surrounding circumstances will be so terrible that you, if you're in and around Jerusalem, should flee. In either case, for those who are pregnant or nursing at that time, he mentions them in particular, obviously because of those two situations, escaping and fleeing and running away will be particularly difficult. So there is a particular warning for them. Referring to the Roman destruction, 
especially, we know that historically Jerusalem was emptied of Jews. Emptied completely for a time. Two words are key to understanding why these things were prophesied. Now, don't you also, you may hear this word from your own mouth hitting your ears these days. You may hear this word from other people's mouths hitting your ears these days. But when we see these kinds of things taking place and these birth pangs that these are, these beginnings of sorrows that these are, do you not hear the words when all this is terrible, amazing, fascinating, and terrible again, stuff? And the word that you hear would be, why? Why are all of these things happening? What in the world is going on? And what is this pointing to? And and this is like this. What can we expect in our tomorrows? Two key words to understanding why. And as uncomfortable as the situations themselves might be, even this answer can leave people feeling a little uncomfortable. Two words prophesied against Jerusalem. In verse 23, Jesus said, these are the days of what? Right. And vengeance, right? And in verse 24, what upon this people? Wrath. Wrath. Vengeance. And wrath. From God. Upon the city. Upon the nation. That is perfectly in keeping with the ramifications of the rejection and killing of Messiah the Prince, the Savior. As Jesus said back in chapter 20, if you recall, when he told the parable of the wicked vine dressers and the destruction they brought upon themselves, nobody hearing that parable would blame the vineyard owner, going, dude, super harsh. Everybody who heard that parable and all of the Old Testament context and the symbolism and the whole thing, everybody hearing that would have gone, yeah. And that's not the vineyard owner's fault. That's you wicked vine dressers' fault. How could you behave that way to the vineyard owner? That was abundantly clear. Nobody would fault the wicked vine dressers. Oh, wait, unless you're the wicked vine dressers. Remember, and it said... They knew he told that parable against them, and so they decided we really need to get rid of this guy. He's embarrassing us. When that took place, the rejection of Messiah and now the wrath and the vengeance of God upon his people for a time, that's what ushers in what Jesus referred to in verse 24. Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. This is the era that we are in now. The time of the trampling down of the holy city and even God's people in particular, but the holy city especially by the Gentiles. Times of the Gentiles has reigned ever since the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 as the Jews, even when they fulfilled other prophecies, of course, by returning to the land and becoming a political nation again. But they still do not have, you know this, they still do not have full control over the holy city itself, over Jerusalem. We know that East Jerusalem is continually disputed over by the Palestinian Authority, of course, and those in the world who are its allies. That list, unfortunately, is a growing number of nations. And you can soon... I think, add our own nation to that list, which will be an enormous disgrace upon us. Recently, it was reported that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu asked our Secretary of State, John Kerry, if the United States intended to continue doing what it has always done, which is veto any anti-Israel resolution that is brought to the UN Security Council, the highest ruling body in the UN is the Security Council. The US is a member of that very small group. Secretary Kerry's response was basically that the administration hasn't really decided what it's going to do going forward, which is a slap in your face that treats you like you're stupid, which says plainly that they probably have actually decided. But that's your answer when you want to wiggle. 
that in and of itself is an obvious departure from this administration's and this country's prior administration's fixed position that any any anti-Israel resolution to the UN Security Council, the US, and sometimes by itself is the only one that vetoes that, standing in defense of Israel. Speaking of the UN, its educational, scientific, and cultural organization, the UNESCO, they just passed a resolution a few days ago, 24 to 6, that denied any historical connection between the Jewish people and the Temple Mount. And if that weren't real, this would be the part where you laugh out loud, because that's one of the dumbest things you've ever heard. And I don't even know all of you that well. But that's one of the dumbest things you've ever heard. Because that's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. No historical connection between the Jewish people and the Temple Mount. Netanyahu responded to that, saying that the theater of the absurd continues at the UN. And then he wondered if they would soon announce that there is no connection between peanut butter and jelly. (laughs) Or between rock and roll. That's the next announcement you'd expect to hear from a group that is that lame. So not only is there constant physical violence, as we know from the news, perpetrated against Jews in relation to Jerusalem itself, but there is also political violence done to them as well on a regular basis like that. It will be, as it has been, only increasing over time, given prophetic scripture, we should expect that. It doesn't mean we have to like it. It means that we look at it and say, that's absurd, that's outrageous, but we're not surprised because we see these things developing from prophecy. Jesus referred to this era as a time of the Gentiles trampling Jerusalem. It's something we as Christians should certainly keep an eye and an ear out for, be praying, as the scriptures tell us, for the peace of Jerusalem, be working for the good of the Jewish people at large, since we like God's promises, since he blesses those who bless them. I like that one. That being said, we've talked about the escape of Christian Jews from Jerusalem back after the Roman destruction. We already talked about that. What about in time to come? Revelation 12, again, we see John was shown about this escape and the threat against the Jews in time to come from Antichrist. He describes how the dragon, that's the serpent of old, the devil, will be officially and finally cast out of heaven, meaning that he apparently still has access to heaven to go and accuse us before God. It's a good thing we have a mediator and an advocate. His name is Jesus. But in Revelation 12, it describes a war in heaven in which Michael the archangel and his angels defeat Satan and his forces. Satan's officially and ultimately cast down to earth, apparently leading up to the arrival of the satanically empowered Antichrist, which we already read about in Revelation 13. But in Revelation 12, it tells us what John sees. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. The woman is Israel. The child is Jesus. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence, separated from the presence of the serpent. So there again we see three and a half year period when Satan's going to try all the more to destroy Israel and also try to destroy those who believe in Christ. Next verse there says, So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So God miraculously protects the Jews that flee from Satan's rage manifested in the Antichrist's actions in time to come that are only developing now. They'll flee to the mountains, they'll be kept safe there, and then we see Satan sees he can't touch them as they're divinely protected there and he turns his full attention to christians any who have come to faith in christ during those end times will face violent merciless persecution from this world system that'll be completely under satan's control if you think it is now it'll be a lot more then or it'll be a lot more obvious let's say that so this all also ties to the wrath and the vengeance of God upon Jerusalem for its treatment of Messiah, this time of God allowing the Gentiles to trample, the Gentiles to abuse and mistreat the Jews, especially related to the holy city, until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. 
So back in Luke 21, Jesus goes back to describing some of the other signs that lead directly up to his return. The abomination of desolation is the most unique and powerful sign, but there are others. Verse 25, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. And on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Hallelujah. These pictures match with Old Testament prophets, as well as prophetic writings in the New Testament elsewhere, especially Revelation. But what I want to point out is the reaction of mankind at large. What will it be, verse 26? Men's hearts will fail them from fear, gripped with fear, stricken with terror, will be the overall mankind response when these things take place. And if you were just a mere man, or a mere woman for that matter, to see these things take place, you'd be terrified too. So would I. This is, this is major bad stuff. This kind of stuff happening makes you feel real small. And they're going to blame other stuff for a time. Climate change. They're going to blame other stuff for a time. You, yeah, all kinds of wonderful ideas. They will have their hearts fail them because of fear. That is a particular, specific, and powerful way in which those who do not know God and those who do know God are going to react in obviously different ways. One group, the larger of the two, is going to be gripped and paralyzed and dominated with fear and terror, and understandably so. Another group, as Jesus made plain earlier with his warnings, ought to not be afraid. Not be deceived, not be surprised, not be shocked, and therefore not be afraid. Does that mean that earthquakes are no big deal? No, they're a very big deal. (laughs) Pestilences are a big deal. All of these things are a big deal in and of themselves. But we're not to be afraid. They will be gripped with fear. And you and I will have occasion for, guess what? testimony testimony how can you not be afraid what's wrong with you people do you not read the news how can you not be terrified these things are happening and they're getting worse and we'll look up our bibles and we'll go i already knew that you know what is that the geico commercial everybody knows that you know apparently not everybody but every every christian will have our own commercials made every christian knows that every real bible believing Authentic Christian. Everybody knows that. Now, even, even now, fearful and dreadful circumstances are causing people to be gripped with fear. Imagine how it will be in these times Jesus has been describing when things get a lot. You think it's bad now. I know that you do. A lot worse. Verse 28, now when these things begin to happen, why will we not be afraid? Look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Well, that's a good reason to not be afraid. What is the message of all of these signs? This is a summary statement here. Don't be afraid. Your salvation is on the horizon. The fulfillment of it. You are categorically saved if you're saved. But the, re- the fulfillment of your salvation is on the horizon. Isaiah 25. And he will destroy on this mountain the surface of the covering cast over all the people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Revelation 19 gives you the picture of the salvation of God coming in the person, his return, Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's the prophetic picture of our redemption in its fullness. The proper reading of all the signs from Jesus is him saying, Here I come and be ready. Be ready. Verse 29, then he spoke a parable to them. Take this one home. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they're already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, 
when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place and heaven and earth will pass away. Even that will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Therefore, you can stand on these things, I'm telling you. But take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and then that day come upon you unexpectedly. So we're warned against fear. We're also warned against sin. Sin, is act, it's, it's tempting to be afraid in times that are fearful, but it's also tempting to just go sin. Because your flesh is still alive, just like mine is. The temptation to be weighed down, he says, your heart's weighed down, not with fear in this case, but with carousing drunkenness and the cares of this life. The temptation to just go, this is terrible. I'm going out. Who's with me? The temptation is there to just pitch moral, absolute, Christian, biblical behavior, pitch it, and just go do whatever. And you know the reasons why? Because everyone's doing it. And laws are even making it so if it's lawful, it must be right. Okay, you know that's not true. If one were to go and do these things, however, Jesus says, this day is going to come on you unexpectedly. And I've just spent 40 verses, 30 verses, saying don't let it come on you unexpectedly. Giving you the things to look for. Don't be surprised by this day. And caught living in such a way that tells people, maybe you don't even know me. That would be a problem. Are you indeed looking forward to the coming of the Lord? Is it... My redemption is near, or is it, I guess he's coming back sometime. Good thing the bars are open. Is that the response, or is it what he just said, lift up your head? Not head down, not head on the things of the earth, but head up, looking for your redemption. And so he says there in 36, watch, therefore, not sin, therefore. Watch, be watchful, be ready, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The chapter concludes in the daytime. He's teaching in the temple. At night he goes out and he stays on the mountain called Olivet. And then early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. This Olivet discourse for his disciples, though, this is where we live. This is what we're looking forward to. How can you look forward to pestilences, famines? and Well, I look forward to them because of what they mean. Not because they themselves are great, but because of what all of these things mean. They mean Jesus is coming back, and with all of his preparatory words, he says, you find yourself ready, prepared, not surprised, not shocked, certainly not afraid, and not giving in to the temptation to just go sin. The world will be doing plenty of that. They will want to numb themselves out and ignore all of these signs that Jesus says, these mean something. So let us walk in such a way that is a worthy way because of the grace he's already given. And in such a way so that those who are feeling pretty hopeless in this time to come, pretty fearful, and then we're going to have an answer ready for the hope that we have. That's going to be an extraordinary wall put up between mankind divided into two groups, hopeless and hopeful. And some at least will look across and go, how? Why? Why? You have hope. And we will be able to pull out these words that never pass away and be able to explain why. Let's pray. Father, In the name of Jesus, who is coming back soon. We come and appeal to you now this morning, based on what you've said, because we believe you. Not because we don't believe you, but because we do. So we see these things, we read these things. The message of them is clear, Lord. These things are coming, and they mean something. They don't mean nothing. They're not random events. 
but these things are part of your dealing with this world and even dealing with your people whom you love and have not turned your back on. And we agree. But I pray, God, for us now that as these developments continue to rise in our time, that we would take heed to the words of Jesus, our Lord, our captain, who is telling us, don't be deceived. Don't be afraid. Don't be surprised and led away into temptations and sin. But be ready and be watchful. Demonstrate the hope that you have and be ready to explain it so that in time to come, you can point people to me. Jesus, we hear you. We ask for the help from your spirit now to be faithful to the end. In your name we pray. Amen.